So hello everyone, um, thanks for attending this presentation about um, using Blender in motorcycle and powerboat design. Um, my name is Rainer, I am team leader of the CAD team of Kiska, which means that uh, within the company I'm probably one of the most boring people and one of the most nerdy ones, so sorry for that. But um, I'm here to talk today about how we are using the tool, how we came to use Blender actually, because initially we were using Maya to do the stuff which we are using, uh, which we are doing now using Blender. First, a few words about Kiska. We are an international design company based in Austria, uh, nearby Salzburg. Uh, we are currently around 180 employees and from 31 nations and see ourselves as a um, full-service provider, meaning that we do design from every possible aspect, from graphic design to automotive design to product design to brand design and things like that. If you look inside the studio, um, that's actually the view which made me join the company. Um, there are no walls inside. So if you look at this, on the right-hand side, you've got the model-making team. In the middle, you've got some open space. And on the left-hand side, you've got the CAD modelers, the design people, the project coordinators, the finance people, all of that in one room. It's ev everything is shared within the company, of course. Outside of the walls, everything's secret. Now let's have a look at the software pipeline that we are dealing with. Uh, back in 2013, we were using Maya for basically concept modeling, like sketching geometry in and getting an idea of what we want. Autodesk alias, I hope the ceiling doesn't come off this year, to do the A-class modeling, and uh, then everything is passed on to one or the other um, engineering software like uh, PTC Creo, which is our main tool, or SolidWorks, or Katia. Three years later, we are using Blender to do the concept modeling and the visualization, which is entirely new uh, in our company. And Maya still is there, but it only acts as kind of a data bridge. That's all we do with it. So back in 2013, if we look at how many poly modelers we actively have, and how many of them are using Blender, that's the figure, zero out of five. And then came this project. Um, the KTM rally was to be redesigned based on an existing frame, and uh, we were looking into doing all kinds of uh, our standard process, which I'm going to explain now. So we started off with a kickoff workshop. We invited Mark Koma, who was uh, the number one writer at that time of KTM, to, uh, to get some, some ideas from him, some feedback. How is riding actually? What do you do on the bike? How do you uh, race and rally the car? We already had some sketches in the background, as you can see. Uh, so some idea we already were able to discuss with him. After that, there was a design phase that followed, as usual. And then we went into Maya mock-up modeling. So we import the engineering uh, package that we received by KTM, put it together with a, a Maya mock-up model, and evaluate that in 3D on the screen first. After that, we go to the milling machine and mill that stuff in clay. We need to see the stuff for real, and not only see it, but also feel it. So we invite the KTM engineers. You can see two of them on, on this picture, um, two lead engineers. And they do ergonomics checks. Uh, they do evaluations of tank volume with the data that we've sent them, see if they can fit regulations. Engineering concepts are thought out. And uh, they also check the visibility of the instrument. So we put some basic stuff just as blocks uh, inside to see if we are on the right track. And main question, as I said before, how does the bike feel like? This you cannot evaluate in 3D. While that happened, uh, we found out that there could be potentially an issue with the windscreen in terms of aerodynamics. So uh, we had, a, let's say, a plan how to fix this. And the plan was to 3D scan the geometry of the clay, which was currently worked on, retopologize the windshield, retopologize a 3D scanned rider, which KTM provided to us, put him on the bike in various positions, then involve a CFD calculation specialist, so for computational fluid dynamics, wind tunnel simulation, basically, to get an idea of what the current uh, status is, alter the shape in CAD, and then rerun the CFD calculation with that until it's fine. And then came the most important step, print it out and test it for real. 
if this works or not. So I fired up Maya and I got this. I knew that I had five licenses in the company and I had no idea why this would happen to me. And I went to the IT and they told me, uh, listen mate, there is six users. One of them in product design started and I didn't know about it. So I went to him, talked to him and he told me, listen mate, I'm working on a client project, I have a tight deadline, I cannot close it. And then I thought, while I was watching this DVD from that strange guy over Christmas, let's give it a shot. And that's when we started with Blender. So what you can see here is the, is the 3D package imported to Blender plus the 3D scan. Retopologizing that is easy. As you know, polymodeling fast and, and rather efficient. Put that on the bike. Rigged it for some basic simulations of like how far do we put the fender in? Does it crash anywhere? Do we have collisions? And then also retopologize a rider and do a very, very basic rig for that one. Uh, the idea of that is to put this guy in the CFD uh, calculation and also test him. Because the worst thing in terms of aerodynamics on a bike is the one riding it. It's not the bike. <coughs> so this kind of stuff we fed into a simulation. And that's what KTM came back with. So what you can see here in terms of colors is uh, the wind speed, which they, uh, which they calculated. And you can see that up on the... On this area, that was our main issue. We also had area, uh, an area on the, on the hand grip uh, bar, but that was not so critical. But we were feeling that too much of the helmet of the rider was exposed to wind. And that could be an issue because there are really high forces uh, imposing into that. Now, I cannot show the final uh, result because the kind of that is, is secret. But in the end, we found a solution to do that brought that back into Alias and started the A-class resurfacing, which you see here on the screen. And the result of that, after you know, engineering the parts, putting it together, testing it, building it for real, was that Mark Coma won the Dakar twice in a row with this bike. Another example of using Blender was when we did the first Husqvarna show bike. Um, that was the sketch that the designer had so far uh, regarding it. And I saw it in a Monday status and I didn't think much of it. Not in terms of it looked like anything easy to do as, as usual, but what he was drawing was that stuff. And I thought it was just a, a 2D graphics printed on it, but no. Uh, he wanted this as a 3D embossed thing, which he gave me as a briefing. So special show bike, we want to show that when the rider is moving on the bike, there is separate zones which would give you some security. And that's what he wanted to communicate. So the CAD modeler said, cool. So what do they look like? The designer said, I don't know. I have to see it first. And then I can tell you if it's good or not. So we did some samples and we used engineering software as we would traditionally approach this and uh, put a small patch together, cut the logo out, printed this on 3D and gave it to him and said, is this fine or not? And, and he said, in general, yes, but I would like to have this changed and that changed and this changed. So what we figured is that this approach would be too slow. So we are losing tons of time um, because the software, the way that we are doing it, would not be flexible enough to really fit these wishes. Another issue was that um, every time the body changes, and that one wasn't final yet, we would have to build all the ribs again. And another one what was we had no idea how to put them from the side to the top. So when the body is finished, we estimate that there would be probably a day left to really complete the final model and send it to 3D printing. This is the status, or one of the different states of the Maya model that we had so far. And what we decided then is give Blender a shot and use the modifier system to get the job done. So first, create a simple fan of these ribs on the side view. Shrink wrap them using axis projection, apply the modifier, delete faces, add another shrink wrap, and so on and so forth. You know this process, I guess. But um, the thing is, doing it by hand still gave the designer the opportunity to really influence every single one, and that's what he wanted. So when you look at the ribs when they are finally constructed, you came out with something like this. 
So basically a geometry which is a volume that sticks into the rest of the body. But we still had one more issue. He also wanted a fade-out effect. So it's not just a pattern applied on top of it. It's a pattern that dis should disappear in certain areas. And the solution to that was astonishingly simple. We basically used the 3D model that was provided at that time and used some lattices and hooks. And that's the final result. So I'm going to switch backwards and forwards. And you can see there's really a small difference just in the main body. And that creates the effect that we wanted. So the ribs should disappear in these zones on a, on a, very, long, uh, on a very long way. After that, the job was actually easy. So we imported the final geometry, we put the logo on, uh, we cut the ribs in, we did the insert stuff. That's a view of the assembly that we had later on in Trio. That's a photo of the show bike, of the detail of the seat, a last chance to have a look at it before we send it to ICMA. And that was the bike on the show. So what were the milestones in Blender development that made us fully jump into it, and which made it a serious uh, competitor? Cyclist Render Engine. That was an easy one. The viewport got faster. Matcaps appeared. The compositor had some speed ups. And most important, Pi menus. Designers wanted to learn polymodeling, and Blender was an easy way of doing that and the number of polymodeling tasks as a total kept increasing and increasing. So why Pi menus? This screenshot here illustrates that in, in, in some way. On the right-hand side, you see Alias, on the middle, Maya, and on the left, Blender. I'm not sure if you can read it, but the general idea is that if you use the same keystroke, you spawn this menu in Alias, this one in Maya, and this one in Blender. So a user which would jump from one software to the other would feel at home. And that made it. So that made the people convert to it. We also did, as probably any studio tries to, in one or the other way, adapt Blender to our needs and write our own add-ons and stuff. And to put that together, that enabled us to, to really fully jump into it. So I gave some classes internally at Kiska. And after a certain amount of time, people started to adapt and got their feet wet with Blender and then fully adapted to it. Um, the KTM Adventure uh, is here as an example for a 3D visualization project. Um, it was the first one that we did, and now there's the new version of the Adventure out since a week. So the iteration came again. And what you see here is a, a basically took a screenshot of the website of KTM if you go there. And the image here is fully rendered in cycles. There's a little bit of compositing done in Photoshop, but it comes out of the render engine pretty much like this. Um, if you go to the website, you also can scroll over the image and you see some detail views. And you can see how, let's say, detailed a bike really is. The problem is. There's little fairing and a lot of engineering, so you cannot hide, hide stuff. You need to show literally everything. And if a render is good or not, uh, you get when you read the feedback that the client sends back to you. So if he tells you, OK, the colors are off, then your render is bad. If he tells you it looks a bit CG, your render is bad. If he tells you, like in this case, that there is not enough brake fluid in the reservoir bottle, the render is good. The same data we used to do the online configurators, they've been around now for two years, I would say. And this is the first one, which was done by Joe, the 3D visualizer, who also did the renderings um, that you saw before. And by the way, it's his birthday today. He's sitting here in the audience. So that really was a game changer for us. Now to the boat stuff. Um, in this example that I showed today, we merely used the Cyclist Render Engine to show what the different stages of, uh, of the design was. In other boat projects, we also used it for modeling in the same process as you have seen before. But here, we had a lot of different exterior designs for the Frausche Dämon, 
which um, needed to be evaluated in one or the other way. So we wanted to see that in 3D spin around. And polymodeling is perfect for this. So you can just spin around in, in, uh, in a very short amount of time. You have the exterior knocked in and can start to shape and, and change detail. And that's really the, the flexibility it offers. It's like sketching in 3D in, to, to some extent. So we did a comparison of the different versions. And that's already a, a render of the chosen design, also done in cycles, presented to the client like this. Um, some detail on the deck started to appear, started to be finalized. Then it was brought to ALS again, this procedure you've heard already. And then we re-imported the ALS geometry to Blender to do nice renderings. And we did this one. The resolution which is printed here is not a mistake. Um, the purpose of this was to plot it out in full scale and stick it on the studio wall. This boat is 14.2 meters long. And to have a decent view on it, we needed to render it in that resolution. And it came out in less than two hours. That was a really amazing uh, performance that we saw there. So another view on the same thing. You can see it starts to get really detailed. The hinges are on and, and all that stuff. Um, on this project, we also did the construction work. So we also engineered the molds, which would be sent to the supplier to mill the thing. And then we had a call from, uh, from a newspaper. They wanted to visit us and write about this boat and the design of it. And at the same time, the live linter came up with the spherical stereo patch. And that was just a perfect uh, way or a perfect example to show them what it looks like inside the boat, because it hasn't been built at that time yet. It was in the middle of the construction. So we rendered a VR stereoscopic image and gave them an Oculus Rift and had a look. And it was really amazing for, for them to see this experience. That's a few shots of the building site. Um, the lead engineer of Rausche is uh, checking the mold and checking what he got from the milling company. And most of it, I like the image on the right, it really shows the size of this object. So, in the middle of 2015, five of six modelers I had on the team had converted over to Blender. There was one guy missing, an Italian one, of course. <laughs> then the Blender conference 2015 came, and Mathilde gave a presentation regarding automotive design at Tata Motors. I thought this is cool, you know, it's finally somebody who's talking about CAD in automotive design, not about design itself. And I posted that video on the intranet. The next day when I came in, we had this. <laughs> That's the status of today. So currently more than 10 Blender users, that includes the designers. And I have another 15 on the watch list who want to convert to it. So it really starts to pick up. Some personal stories that I collected on the way before I came here. Um, so, very easy to, to nail down design, evaluate proportion. Uh, the modifier system was mentioned more than one time, because it really helps you. Um, it has been an essential tool to us, no turning back now. I didn't like it in the beginning, I like it now, guess who? <laughs> and also the community was mentioned. So the way that the, the thing that the community reacts so quickly on feedback is totally new to someone who has been used to purchase software, so to speak. And finally, the flexibility for design changes. That's what we need. Now, I also have a wish list with me, of course. Would be too boring without. And the main thing actually goes back to the first slide that I showed you about the pipeline. Um, Maya is still the data bridge. And we would like to change that. So I've linked a presentation, uh, which is basically, a, it was a university student uh, writing in his master thesis about subdivision surfaces and the linkage to NURBS. Maybe it helps some, one or the other to find a solution to convert polygon data over to real uh, NURB surfaces, because that's what we do, that's what we need. The layer manager was the second most mentioned thing believe it or not. So having unlimited layers and be able to name them is a huge thing for us because we are having really complex scenes. The viewport speed, that's 2.8. Okay, settled. And the compositor memory management. 
Cycle Shadow Catcher. Please, please put it into master. It's working great already. The denoising would be a nice to have. And one thing regarding the documentation actually is there is all kinds of information about color management. It, it's a bit cluttered everywhere. Uh, there is an information on the new uh, documentation, on the old one. There's something on Stack Exchange. There's a lot of things going on, and some start to contradict each other. It would be really nice to have a solid guideline. How do I set this thing up so it works for photoreal rendering? And finally, I make a nice design button. Thanks for joining today. <laughs>